Oftentimes, when I'm in conversations related to broadening participation in computer science, it's mostly limited to conversations about kind of the gender binary and race and ethnicity. And there's almost no consideration of identity behind that. And we're all much richer people than that. Um, you know, I work with people with disabilities, and they're often left out of that conversation. Or if they're included, it's like a laundry list of attributes. But it's not really meaningfully included in those efforts. Um, there's a lot of uh, programming tools that are inaccessible to blind students. So they go to take, say, AP Computer Science Principles. Almost every high school that that's taught in is teaching it with a tool that's not accessible. So blind students are not going to be able to participate. Um, so that's a really significant barrier to some of those students. You know, beyond that, we don't have a lot of good data about how many students with disabilities are taking computer science classes, getting computer science degrees, and graduating. Um, and if we don't collect that data, we just don't know um, what's going on. So we talk a lot about getting people with disabilities into computer science education and into employment, but a whole other piece of it is teaching about accessibility and disability within the computer science curriculum. You know, that's part of this identity inclusive computing education. And what we hear from tech companies is that they really can't hire enough folks that have knowledge about accessibility in order to then build accessible products. So if we can start teaching students about accessibility in their courses, they'll develop skills that are useful for industry, but then also will mean we we'll have more accessible technology. And so the next generation of students will start with better technology. I think we know from research that by the time students get to higher education, if that's their pathway, that their identities are often already created. Um, their sense of future is often already narrowed. And if computer science isn't part of their considerations or they feel like they don't know enough about computer science to even take an introductory course, that knowing computer science in some ways is a prerequisite for knowing computer science, um, which gets people caught up in that, that higher education space. But I think if we put it in K-12 and it's not a place where we say, hey, who wants to learn computer science and we wait for the hands to go up, um, then that would greatly improve inclusion and diversity. Um, similar to reading, we don't ask who wants to learn to read and then teach them. We um, assume that it's part of our literacy and introduce it in schools. And I think then you have K-12 students and their diversity. to that knowledge early on, have places to connect to the community and also be able to start forging their own sense of identity, their, maybe their school identity, maybe their career identity, maybe just their self-expression identity that is inclusive of computer science. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today's topic is what's DEIA got to do with ABET? And we are joined by an esteemed panel of colleagues who are working on uh, DEI and accessibility related topics in the ABET space. Um, we have a lot to get into today. We're really aiming to give you all an understanding of what's being done, what's been done, what was the motivation, and what's to come. So with that, I want to take a lot of time. I won't take a lot of time, and I do want to jump into the discussion, and I want to encourage everyone attending to please leverage the Q&A option in the chat. Um, the Q&A questions will allow us to feed those to the panel discussion in real time. And no questions are off limits, almost no questions, we'll say. So with that, I want to allow everyone an opportunity to first introduce yourself and tell us where you are and how you fit into the grand scheme of the work being done at ABET. So I will start with Richard Olawayin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nikki. Uh, my name is Richard Olawayin, and uh, I currently chair the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Advisory Council. And our council, basically, we advise the ABET board of directors on all of these different initiatives and the, some of the updates that we'll be discussing today. So it's really good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pass it next to Andy Phillips. Well, thanks, Nikki. My name is Andrew Phillips. I am a recently retired provost at the Naval Academy, 
but the current executive director for CSAB, which is the professional society within the ABET world that handles computing accreditation issues, everything from program criteria to training to uh, placement, recruitment and placement of the evaluators who do ABET visits. So that's the reason I'm, I'm associated with the program here. Thank you. Going in clockwise order, Donna Reese. And I'm Donna Reese, and I am a retired uh, computer science department head from Mississippi State University um, and serving currently as past president of um, CSAB, uh, but um, also a, um, a member, have been a member for a number of years of the criteria committee, looking at the DEI uh, criteria within the computing space, um, as well as uh, the criteria sort of across the four commissions of ABET. Thank you, Donna. And bringing us home, Stephanie Smullen. Yes, uh, hi, I'm a retired professor of computer science from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And I have worked with ABET for 20, over 20 years. And for uh, the past four years, I headed up the effort to get wording and some uh, uh, meaningful changes in, in the area of diversity and accessibility for, in a, within uh, the computer com commission. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. All right, let's jump into it. So first up, can you talk about what motivated ABET to even pursue DEIA updates? Yeah, Nikki, I can take that question. I can uh, just, uh, first of all, I would like to give some kind of background, uh, you know, perspectives on why ABET is doing this. So basically, globalization of educational, you know, fields underscores importance of having diverse perspectives and also inclusivity, which everything is aimed at student success. And EBET understands that students must be equipped with relevant uh, competencies to be able to thrive in diverse work environments and also to contribute meaningfully uh, to their different fields. And dating back to uh, 1932, EBET as a forward-thinking organization uh, was actually established by seven engineering societies. And at that time, they established the Engineers Council for Professional Development, which was called ECPD. And the organization actually adopted positive changes to broaden participation and also to enhance the quality of education. One notable change that they you know, um, enacted then was in 1980 when ECPD was renamed. It was renamed to the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. And this change basically reflected a commitment, commitment to promoting diversity in STEM education, which allowed at that time also for the inclusion of a wider range of technical uh, disciplines. And furthermore, in 2005, to reflect an expanded scope, the organization began using the acronym ABET only, just ABET. And the transition from the full name to the acronym ABET also signifies a strategic shift towards inclusive language and also representation within uh, the STEM education community. So this change in branding acknowledges the diverse range of skills and knowledge and also backgrounds that contribute to STEM fields beyond uh, you know, the traditional engineering field. We now have other disciplines such as technology. We also have computing and also applied and natural sciences fields within uh, you know, the EBET world. So by adopting a more inclusive identity, EBET actually sends a message, a message of welcome and also recognition to institutions and also to STEM programs here in the United States and beyond, promoting equity and also access in STEM education and we do so by actually fostering a sense of belonging and representation among students, educators, professionals, programs, institutions, and in different disciplines. And by recognizing and accrediting these uh, various fields, EBET promotes a more inclusive and equitable STEM education landscape that ensures that students from various backgrounds and interests will have access to quality education and opportunities 
within the STEM fields. So um, an ad hoc uh, committee on diversity and inclusion was established in 2015. And the committee came out with, you know, with recommendations, including the revision of the ABET diversity policy to reflect the concept of inclusion and also the creation of an inclusion, diversity, and equity council. The council was approved in November uh, 2018, and uh, the council was convened in 2019, making it ABET's fifth council. Uh, ABET, of course, has other councils, the Academic Advisory Council, the Accreditation Council, Industry Advisory Council, and the Global Council. And through the motivations from Computing Accreditation Commission, with the introduction of accessibility, the name of our council was officially changed to the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Council this past Saturday at the EBET um, Spring Governance Meeting. So basically, the IDEA Council reports to the Board of Directors, and we've been charged to promote inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility within EBET, its activities, its volunteer base, and also its accredited programs. And EBET constituencies and key areas are represented on the Council. So since its formation, the Council has been very active with promoting positive change across um, EBET, including its accredit accreditation activities. And the Council also provides the Board of Directors, as I mentioned during my introduction, um, which recommended actions for implementation. So to the question of what actually motivated um, EBET to pursuing some of these updates in uh, accreditation criteria, EBET, and EBET basically listens to employers and also industry professionals, and they've been emphasizing the need for graduates with cross-functional competencies and also because all of these different ideas align with EBET's commitment to ensuring student success and also access, um, and also the emphasis on the globalization of you know, industrial needs, not just in one discipline, but across different disciplines. EBET actually recognizes that DEI and accessibility, which we now call IDEA within uh, EBET is very integral to a well-rounded education. So EBET sought to enhance the quality of educational uh, programs by incorporating DEI and A in the accreditation criteria and also its policies and procedures to be able to create equitable um, access to high quality education from, for students from diverse backgrounds and ultimately enhancing their success in academia and also uh, beyond academia. And this approach basically supports not just students but also faculty by fostering inclusive uh, learning environments uh, that promotes the development of diverse perspectives and also skills. So I'd like to add just a little bit of, of, of sort of some of the motivation on the computing side as, as well to, to what Richard said. I think when ABET started looking at um, adding some, uh, some language to our accreditation criteria to make sure that our students had the appropriate skill set to be successful, as Richard said, um, we, ha we sometimes have the uh, tendency in ABET to um, have each of our four commissions sort of go their own way and start looking at what what they need to add in their area. And so I think um, the Computing Ed Accreditation Commission and the Computing Area Delegation has been pushing from the very beginning, um, along with some of the, of the uh, folks from our Academic Advisory Council to really make sure that whatever solution we came up with in terms of uh, uh, criteria changes was, was it, consistent across those four commissions um, because we don't we have a lot of institutions that will have programs that that span multiple um, commissions and we didn't want to have a divergent set of qualifications or criteria that didn't um, that weren't cohesive and so um, the computing um, subgroup had, has been pushing for some harmonization which I think led to some of the things we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of um, uh, some um, language in our harmonized criteria, but 
but also in the computing world, um, we were starting to see some of um, sort of the increasing importance of, of, of the machine learning AI and, and the, the role of biases and seeing some of those come into play. And not that AI hasn't been around for a long time, but the, the, the new move for those some of those systems to become mainstream, um, I think has really elevated the general awareness of these issues. And so um, making sure that our students coming out of ABET accredited computing programs um, understood about those aspects within computing um, that are idea related um, it was is also very important on the computing side. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. Um, so let's get into the process because this has been pretty lengthy. And I don't think the general public knows when this started and how long it's been. So can you talk a little bit about the process for even developing and potentially implementing these updates, especially to Donna's point of how uh, commissions are usually off and doing their own things? Is everybody synchronized or, or is it very disjoint right now? Hmm. Stephanie, you must start. You want me to do it? <laughs> well, I uh, well as as always, uh, everyone doesn't agree all the time. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a process of of working, uh, you know, together with the commissions. Maybe you work with one commission for uh, on an issue, and then another one, uh, and it goes round and round in that fashion. So it takes a lot of time, for sure. Yeah, so th for those of you that are not familiar, there's sort of a standard process for criteria updates. And so um, those uh, criteria, if they are in part of what we call the harmonized criteria, um, they have to go through all four commissions. Um, and then when the language, if, if you get all four commissions to approve it, the language goes out to what we call a first reading. So we start soliciting um, input from um, the general public and people are accrediting, you know, the, the institutions that have accredited programs. Um, those changes that are specific to our, a specific um, um, commission, um, still have to go through uh, that same process, but just within that um, one uh, commission. Um, and so uh, once that you have a whole year of, of public comment, um, there's still a whole nother year where you take that feedback and put changes in and get it out for everybody to look at. So the whole process can be very lengthy and, and it has been going on uh, for, for I, I think as Stephanie said, four or five years, we've been working on this committee to, to put together um, some language. And the language that is currently being worked on sort of occurs in three different places. And some of those are all in different uh, states at this point. And I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on, but it is a lengthy process. You, you don't want to change the language and the criteria just overnight and expect um, programs to be able to react instantaneously and be able to um, satisfy that. They, they need to have some warning. They need to be able to understand what, um, what those changes mean. We need to train the volunteers to evaluate those changes. We need the institutions to be trained on what, what those uh, changes mean. So yeah, it's a lengthy process. Um, and it's it has been going on for a while, and sometimes it feels like we're not making progress. But I actually think we are we are making progress, and um, maybe we'll we'll show some of that in a little bit. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can just add a little color to that because you know Donna, what you said is exactly right. The Computing Commission itself has been working on this for four four or five years, and so one might reasonably ask, well, why isn't anything done yet? How long does it take? And part of you, you answered that in part by saying, well, this is done on a on a cycle that works in years, what one year at a time. So there was sort of four shots at it. In that early year or so, the Computing Commission proposed reasonable uh, language for DEI a day. But it turns out the other commissions came up with better language that was different. And it's, as you've already said, it's not good to have the four commissions going their own separate ways when you could reasonably all adopt the same language. And quite honestly, the Computing Commission and CAD, the Computing Area Delegation, recognized that the language we were promoting wasn't as strong, wasn't as good 
as the other ones. So we had to pull it back. So from a from a distance, you might say, well, what's going on with those computing folks? They can't seem to figure it out. Well, we did figure it out. We just decided we liked what the other commissions had came up with in the institutional criterion. And then in our own, you know, program specific criteria, the, the computing specific stuff, um, you know, you have to you have to word this in a way that people can understand what you're trying to say. And we'd struggled to get that right. So I think when if we're ready to post it, we might as well go ahead and post the the draft language of, of the three areas so people can see what we're talking about. And I, I would say, finally, there's language both that's harmonized among all the commissions and that's more specific to computing that we think, think scratches the itch. So from one perspective, not much has happened. And from another perspective, a lot has happened. And that lot is we're getting much better language that we think is actually going to be understandable and doing the right thing here. So um, I think this is the year when we will finally have something, um, you know, out and ready to be adopted. And I, I wouldn't have said that two years ago. I would have said, we're just not sure yet. And I will say when we first started, there was a great deal of confusion about how this was to be applied. Was this to be applied to an institution to see that the student body met these criterion? And of course, that is not the role of ABED in any way to tell institutions what they should do, but it is the, the role of ABET to be sure that the students can go out in the world and be able to succeed in a wide uh, area. So this maybe is part of why it kind of took so long. We had to get everyone on the same page. Thank you. And I, I made notes about points uh, that I think are important that Andy, you mentioned about one, you want to make sure it's accurate. You want to make sure it's clear and you want to make sure that you're doing it right. And a lot of times when we talk about DEI and accessibility, there's a lot of push to get things out, and maybe iterate as you go. But that lengthy cycle, like you talked about, makes it even more difficult. So it's kind of like you don't have one shot, but you kind of do have one shot to really get something that everybody can buy into without having to worry about revising it another year and then losing people. We all recognize that what's going to be put out there will be imperfect, but at least it has to be understandable. People right. who, who read it have to say, oh, I I think I know what you mean, rather than can somebody interpret those what those words mean? That, that would be a terrible place to be. So we, I think we've got language that when people read it, they'll say, you know, okay, I, I think I understand where you're headed with this, even if it's if there are probably other versions that could improve it. Thank you. And I'm, for I'm the sorry, y'all. It won't ahead. let me. It won't let me paste the language into the. Oh, Stephanie can paste it. Oh. Uh, I can paste it. I I will go ahead and paste. Okay, it. Okay, great. Everyone. Okay, thanks. It was. Yes. I don't know for whatever. I just, yes, I Got didn't. Oh well, that came to me directly and not to the. Wait, oh, well, that was who I addressed it to. Did that All right, well, we'll move on then while we're getting that going. Um, the next question I have, and I want to note to everyone that we will be sharing the criterion updates, the criteria updates, excuse me, um, and we're going to get into the current status of those as well. Before we get to that, though, I do have two more questions. Um, and the first one I want to direct to you, Richard, um, can you talk about the ABED Idea Council's role in this process? Yes, yeah, yes, Nikki, thank you. Um, so basically, the Idea Council, um, since the establishment of the Council, we actually began with the definition. Uh, we, we created definition, definition for inclusion, for diversity and equity. And basically, these definitions were very important. So as to lay the groundwork for the work that we were about to do then, and also to provide for meaningful um, engagement and also to promote the work that we were doing. And furthermore, the definition for accessibility has recently been added and all definitions have been approved by the board of directors. And another important role that the Idea Council engaged and you know, task that we did was to develop a dynamic framework. We call it dynamic because the framework is a living document, which we understand that as we get more information and as we engage with all ABET constituencies and beyond, 
we would, um, you know, there'll be need to actually make changes as we move along. So the framework for actually implementing most of these changes to the idea that we are, you know, this idea concept within uh, around ABET, um, the framework document was approved and it's also on the ABET website. And all of these, um, you know, initiatives have been approved as recommended to the board of directors. So specifically, there are other kinds of activities that we've engaged in on the idea council. And Donna, uh, thank you very much. She was actually a member of our council uh, at some point, and uh, you know, and we also have fourteen other members this uh, this term that have been working extensively, including organizing regular meetings with various ABET constituencies and also gathering information and insight uh, based on any any you know. Uh, all of the uh, uh, the idea uh, guidelines and also the recommendations that we make to the board of directors, because we don't we just don't make those recommendations um, in isolation. Uh, we engage extensively, and one other thing that we've done in the past was to host uh, uh, you know focus groups and also summits and workshops to basically discuss specific challenges or even opportunities uh, relating to promoting idea within ABET and for ABET constituencies. And we also establish partnerships with external organizations and experts. Because at, on the Idea Council, we have a speaker series, which uh, Nikki, thank you also for coming to the Idea Council to present. Uh, she's come to the Idea Council to present and also to provide resources, uh, helping our efforts in making recommendations to the Idea Council. One very important thing that we do at the commission level is um, engagement with ABET commissions, including the computing Accreditation Commission on considering adding um, idea or DEI and A in their commission specific criteria. And this was an initial step and has been discussed extensively already today. We also later emphasized the need to make these changes uniform to extent uh, you know, that that would be possible under one ABET initiative um, across all commissions. This means that you know, these changes could be harmonized as much as possible. Although some of the, uh, the criteria, they are non-harmonized, but we try to also promote the need for uniformity to be able to provide for uh, consistency as well as clarity, just as Andy mentioned, and even coherence and collaboration that will ensure a cohesive approach across accredited uh, programs. And finally, um, another uh, you know, kind of engagement or the role of the Idea Council is our collaboration with the Accreditation Council in making some of these changes, particularly to the harmonized part of the, you know, this update that we're discussing. And the harmonized criterion, which is being considered at this time is institutional support, which is criterion eight. So what we did was we collaborated with the uh, Accreditation Council for the revision of this criterion, particularly with the definition of respectful environment. And we also worked with the Accreditation Council to update the program evaluator and also the team chair competency models to basically ensure that uh, our expert reviewers are aware of what D, I, and A actually means in the context of accreditation. And the new competency model, uh, the two models were approved at this last uh, Saturday's uh, board, of, board of Directors and Board of Delegates uh, you know, meetings. We also uh, currently we're working to review training materials and also resources to basically enhance understanding of this concept in accreditation material. So we're currently engaging with the accreditation council in reviewing best practices and also methods to be able to ensure that um, all constituencies understand what needs to be done and um, and to also provide resources answering some questions that many or other areas of ABET may actually have concerning this update. Thank you, Richard. Um, and to the audience as well, you see in the chat, uh, the harmonized criterion eight around institutional support, uh, as well as the definition of what a respectful environment would be, that's part of that discussion. And then the CAC specific language around criterion five uh, regarding curriculum and 
I want to go back to something uh, based on a question from the audience. Richard, um, you can lead off with this. And if anybody else has comments as well, because I think this is a good point. You mentioned that the idea council kind of worked across all the different commissions to help them with crafting language and other things. And the question that came in is that institutions face a wide, wide, uh, wide array of accreditors. In the US, there are regional accreditors. Outside the US, there are governmental accreditors. In both cases, there are professional accreditors such as ABET, AACSB, and many more. How can ABET's efforts be crafted in a way that avoids conflicting and overlapping DEIA expectations? Is that even possible? Well, that's a very good question. And we, we certainly uh, considered this particular point while doing and also while creating the pathway for, for ensuring that we have consistency uh, with some of the things that we proposed. First, for, you know, for example, I mentioned the definition which sets the framework and also the guidelines for what we'll be doing because without actually defining what we're trying to do, it would have been kind of difficult for us to be able to move forward. So part of what we did was to engage. You know, We engaged um, across the board and we listened uh, to not just ABET constituencies, people from outside, uh, we listened to, and we also reviewed, we reviewed materials from other agencies outside and within the US. And we brought in experts from within the US and outside the US different accrediting uh, agencies and also experts were part of this conversation that we listen to. Um, of course, we cannot have the same kind of or, or uniform approach to addressing DEI as others you know, would do, but we try as much as possible to not to create confusion, but also to, to align the, the fundamental idea of what DEI actually means or DEI and A actually should mean in the context of STEM education. So that was our main focus. And basically all of the ideas that we gathered were very helpful uh, towards you know, shaping what we have today. And in, in the document I mentioned earlier, which is the dynamic framework that I mentioned earlier, which is on ABET's website, well, we basically created and we suggested goals and metrics. How do we measure progress towards meeting each of these goals? We created all of those and most of those goals and metrics were uh, in sync and also in, a, in alignment with some of this uh, feedback that we got from external reviews that we did, including even the International Standards Organization, the ISO 30415. Uh, we, you know, for, the, for diversity and inclusion, we also use that as well as part of, um, you know, the document that we reviewed and different parts that we looked at. Thank you. Anyone else have thoughts? Well, I would just comment that, uh, so it's a good question, but I would just remind everybody that um, regional accreditation, let's take take that as an example, already has significant overlaps with ABET criteria, specifically in assessment. Regional accreditors all require assessment processes, as does ABET. Student success is another big one. Th those aren't issues where, that, where ABET's expectations and regional accreditor expectations are in alignment for overlapping. That's not really an issue. What could be an issue is if they're in conflict but I think if you take a look at the proposed language we've posted, it's I think it's hard to hard to see how what is being proposed would be in conflict with what any other accreditation agency would expect. So it's a good question, but I don't think that in the end that's going to to turn out to be a, a problem. The only other the thing I would add to that is that I think it's also important um, that a lot of time the the regional accrediting bodies are looking at the institution as a whole and they don't get down to the specifics of the engineering computing applied natural science whatever uh, degree programs and there there are many of these examples i think that you could that you could find um and and some of the wording as we're proposing that is very computing specific we want Yes, we want our students to be aware of DEI overall and and the, and the the issues there. Um, but we also want them to understand how that directly impacts what they're doing in computing. This is not an add-on that they take in their gen ed and it doesn't apply at all to what they're doing in their computing profession. These are these are skill working with diverse teams is a skill set that is absolutely required to be successful in computing. And being able to understand about biases 
in software systems is absolutely computing related and would not um, necessarily be appropriate in criteria for in, a, in other areas. So I, I think there are, um, yeah, I think you're right, they're not in conflict, but I think it's also important that students understand that this, this is not one of those gen ed things that they like to blow off, right? This is, this is something that's going to help you be successful in your computing career, and you need to understand this as it applies to your discipline. So that would be my, my answer. Thank you. And I think uh, all of those responses speak to and answer another question from the audience around uh, why couldn't these criteria be uh, better or would they be better served in the regional accreditor responsibilities? Um, and again, uh, it, and to your points, I just also like to note how doing that always shifts the fact that computing exists in isolation and it's not an issue <laughs> that uh, DEI and accessibility aren't issues in computing when we keep pushing them to other agencies and bodies to, to address. So thank you for that. Um, let's get into the current status. Where we are with all of this, what is it? What's happening? Uh, uh, yeah, every, every year, that's the question. Where are we with this? The language you see proposed in the, in the chat is language that has, uh, been developed and discussed at length by a relatively small group of people. I think St Stephanie sort of alluded to a, a subcommittee of a criteria committee. Um, so those folks are really in the know on what's being proposed here. But from there, it has to be adopted and endorsed by the full committee. From there, um, it has to be adopted by the commission itself. And from there, it has to be uh, adopted by the computing area delegation. Uh, all of those steps are lined up to, well, most of those steps are lined up to happen by the end of July of this year. So it is possible if everybody uh, is in agreement that we'll have approvals of the language you see on the screen by early fall. Or C5, which you're talking about. Uh, yeah, for, for C5. C8 is the harmonized criteria. I think that's already sort of out in, in first reading. Um, now, because it's only been uh, debated and discussed in a small group, we, we uh, the, you know, the folks in CSAB and on the commission, it's incumbent on us to get out in front of some people's concerns so that at the commission, when some people see it for the very first time, we don't try to reinvent the wheel. We don't go through every single possible what if, you know, what about this? What did you think about that? We address those concerns up front because we already know what a lot of those will be. That, that's what's going to be crucial in getting it approved this time. So, um, you know that that I think we can give that that question a really strong answer at the end of July. Right now, it's all sort of preparatory. We need to prepare the commission of something like seventy or eighty voting members, and perhaps a dozen people right now are sort of read in on what the the specifics are. So we have a lot of work to do to prepare for for that big moment. But but let me answer that also for the C eight. Uh, for the harmonized language that that, that we sh that we showed in the chat, also that language has been approved, and it is out um, for for what we call public comment. And quite frankly, we haven't gotten very many um, public comments. And so, I would encourage uh, those of you who have accredited programs, or even if you don't and you're just interested in the language, you can go to the ABET website and and click on the big button that says accreditation. Um, and, and uh, scroll down to where it says uh, proposed changes or criteria changes and look at those um, that, that C8 and, and you, can, you can make comments. So if there are things that we need to be looking at um, with, that, uh, with that particular criteria that is out there for public comment, um, then you can go ahead and make comments. And I would encourage people to, to um, make, uh, even if you look at it and you say, yeah, that looks good. Tell us that too. Um, a lot of times we hear only from the people who really aren't happy with what's out there and what we're proposing. And so it would be good to get a little balance and to know that that that, 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 that there are people who, who've looked at it and, and think we're, we're headed in the right direction or tweaks or whatever, but um, do that. And then keep an eye out on that next year for these changes that we're talking about with the C5, whether they're exactly this or there's some version, you know, modification of of it, if we are successful in getting this through those approval stages in some state, they will be out there for public comment next year. And so then you would be able to do a similar type of thing and help us to improve um, uh, that language as well going forward. 
Yeah. But even even uh, without the public comment, when these uh, criterion are used to evaluate institutions, we often find problems and that it, find that it needs revision even then. So these things are not set in stone. Thank you for that. Um, Stephanie, I want to go back to you as well. Can you give some insight on uh, the group that developed this, how that group was formed? Because I'm sure some people are going to ask, like, how did you ensure that people who know what they're talking about are there? Well, we had you, Nikki, <laughs> as a part <laughs> of our group. And then we had several, uh, Donna and several other CSAB members as well as uh, CAC members uh, with uh, lots of experience with accreditation. We uh, didn't really have any total newbies in the group. So uh, it was, everyone had very diverse ideas and uh, it helped that we could blend them together and understand uh, try to understand what it was we were trying to do and say what we meant, which is a difficult thing everyone mm -hmm. knows. Uh, the other thing I will add to that is um, since, since we are talking about computing criteria, um, the general criteria for computing, um, it's important to realize that that criteria applies across all of the computing areas that CSAB uh, and, and ABET accredit. So that's that's not just computer science, that's cybersecurity, it's data science, it's information systems, information technology, and then also uh, programs that are just have other names than that that are just general uh, that are that uh, that are just general we have networking, other you know uh, programs like that. Um, so, um, we've also got to make sure that there's representation across all of those disciplines on that committee and that the language that we come up with is not specific to any of those particular disciplines, that it applies across all of computing. Um, and so we had to make sure that they... Um, that the, the the group was balanced with respect to that. And and the other area of, of, of diversity of that is that we also have associates programs, two-year programs, for, so, uh, you know, BS degrees, and we are currently working on criteria for master's. So in addition, whatever language we have has to make sense at those different levels, of course, with different levels of expectations. So it really is sort of a balancing act to, to make sure that what you're doing is a, what the, what you're wanting to include is appropriate across all of those groups and that you're specific in the language enough that everybody understands what, what it is that they need to do to satisfy those criteria. Thank you. And I think an important part to note as well is the diversity of uh, not just the positions, but positionalities, disciplines, and more important, also institution types. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that every institution is represented uh, on that team. I want to go back to something Richard said earlier that I made a note of around uh, the importance that ABET placed on relevant competencies to thrive in work environments, and also the historical context of ABET adopting a more inclusive identity name to then create more space in the STEM ed landscape. Um, because we are all very aware that we're sitting in a time right now where there are clear attacks on DEI uh, in a number of states in the U.S. specifically, uh, and those are translating to mandates and removals of DEI offices at state-based institutions, etc. And so with this, how is... Um, this group and ABET as well as CAC overall thinking about addressing these, especially for those programs that may be in a state where DEI is now banned? Well, I can, I can offer insight from the IDEA Council and also from the perspective of ABET as a whole, because um, on the IDEA Council, we have been working with ABET leadership and we've been carefully, you know, evaluating the impact of legislations, you know, that oppose DEI efforts across the country. And as, um, you know, many of these legislations emerge in various states, we continue to also engage in dialogues, you know, basically to understand uh, the potential challenges and also the opportunities that may exist, you know, by bringing this, uh, you know, some of these legislations 
on. So this basically involves monitoring the proposed legislations at different levels from the local to state and federal levels uh, that could actually impact the DEI efforts in STEM education as a whole. So we also um, assess potential you know, legal implications and also compliance. So the different compliance issues. Um, and what we've done is that we've actually engaged with ABET's uh, legal team in understanding the implications of this legislation on accreditation requirements and also processes. Because ABET um, intends to work and continue to work to ensure that the accreditation requirements specific to this new update remain in compliance with relevant laws and regulations. And another um, approach you know, for considering you know, these legislations is through our Idea Council and the speaker series, which I mentioned before, because we've engaged widely you know, with stakeholders, including um, accredited programs and also industry partners um, legal experts and also professional societies and advocacy groups. Uh, basically, the idea here is to be able to gather inputs and also perspectives on how some of these barriers could impact compliance uh, with requirements in program accreditation. And part of this engagement is to learn how to navigate the complex landscape uh, without actually violating any laws. So um, a recommendation on the updates to uh, the accreditation criteria that we agree to is the addition of the part that says consistent with the institution's mission. So this basically ensures that each program can assess if the requirement does not violate any laws or codes in their local jurisdiction and also at their institution. So um, what we're doing right now is that we're collaborating with the Accreditation Council. So the Idea Council actually aims to support the development of educational resources, guidance, and also training for uh, not only the volunteer program evaluators and team chairs, but also accredited programs uh, to prepare for the implementation of these proposed changes. And I know a lot of people have you know, asked in the past that will this actually impact ABET's commitment? No, ABET has demonstrated strong commitment to upholding its DEI and A values. And how do I know this? I know this because ABET released a public statement on implementing the AI concept into the criteria. And this was published last year on June 26, and it's on ABET's website. And I'm going to quote from that statement because it's Richard may have frozen on us. Maybe he'll come back. Um, anyone else have thoughts in the meantime? Yeah. yeah, I'd like to just build on something Richard said, because, you know, a few moments ago, I said there are some issues we already know are going to be raised by members of the commission. And, and it was raised in the chat right here. The what are the implications of current climate and legislation on these? That's a that's a predictable question we already know will get asked. And as Richard just said, the proposed language that you can see on the screen has the phrase, you know, must in, the curriculum must include diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility topics consistent with the institution's mission. That's the phrase that allows an institution to say, well, look, if the state has mandated that we can't have curriculum on this, then that, that cr criteria says, okay, we're not going to ask you to violate the law. It, it's, you know, do it only that's when it's consistent with the mission. So that's the answer to that particular question. And not, notwithstanding the fact that ABET will continue to push uh, the importance of DEI and A anyway. And Maybe for the know, day ABET when the states has, reverse the legislation. Pardon me. I just wanted to point out that ABET does have experience in countries around the world where DEI is not possible. Uh, so this isn't a new thing. Mm -hmm we have to deal with. Uh, so I, I, I think I can read the part that Richard was going to say when he froze, and I think it is meaningful. So um, the statement that is out there, um, in particular, there is one uh, 
paragraph that says, despite this recent activity referring to the legislation in different states, we remain fully committed to advancing our DEI goals for higher education. As an organization focused on making the world a better place, ABET believes that we can only address the many complex challenges facing our society through a welcoming, diverse, and inclusive environment. So I suspect that was the paragraph that Richard had intended to read to us when he froze. And so I'll let that be Richard's last word. <laughs> he can't get back on. Thanks, y'all. Um, I see a comment that uh, the information couldn't be copied. Uh, we'll try to see how to address that and get uh, a version of it to you. You may have to screenshot it in the chat in the meantime. Um, there's a question, though, that came in based on the comments you've had, which is, if DEI is legally inconsistent with an institution's mission, then how can that institution meet the criterion eight of having a respectful environment? Well, I think you would argue at your institution that you don't need you don't need um, curriculum on DEI and A in order to treat people uh, with dignity and respect. That 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 particular um, institutional support criterion says create and foster a respectful environment in which program students, faculty, and staff, and administrators and the student outcomes can be attained. It doesn't say that you have to have curriculum on it. It says you have to have a respectful environment. That that would be the argument I would make at that institution. Thank you. I, and I think it just really, again, that cultural context is really important. It looks like we have Richard back. So Richard, we wanna give you a minute if you have a chance to close out with what you were saying. We may be still connecting. Okay. Yeah, he's still connecting. Um, in the interim, I do want to go back to something, Andy, you noted about getting in front of concerns and um, the fact that there will be individuals who are going to push back potentially at uh, based on this voting body. How can we, as the general public computer science discipline, what can we do to help provide support for the efforts that are happening that can hopefully influence those decisions. Um, right. I, I think that in this instance, we, first of all, it's what I said. We have to be out in front of it. Rather than react to things, we have to proactively address the issues where we know there are going to be concerns. And one of those concerns is the state level legislation. But another one will be people's um, sort of um, inexperience with how to implement DEI and A in the curriculum. And because you know, we're know we're computing professionals and we haven't spent our careers working in that field. Most of us haven't. So we're going to need help. And that's, I think, where, where ACE is really a crucial partner is that this is something that you all are experts on. And so to, to the extent that ACE can provide great examples for others to follow, that will calm a lot of concerns that people have um, I thought the lead-in video was really was really key. There was a conversation mostly about accessibility. Um, so it, that that's exactly why accessibility has been added into the criteria. And so those are some people who presumably have really great examples that you know we can leverage uh, to to sort of show people what what it is we're really talking about doing here. Yeah, and I think Nikki, you know, the project that that you're working on with with CSAB that we're part of in terms of uh, putting together. Uh, material that we can use to to both make institutions aware of the sort of breadth of different ways there are to address these issues. This is there is not just one set of topics you need to go and cover and check it off and you're done. There is lots of different ways everybody can find a, a set of material uh, that will that will resonate with them that they can use within their own institutional context. Um, to to satisfy uh, these these criteria and the 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 breadth of examples across the curriculum, for example, that your three C fellows and others have been looking at, I think are going to provide some um, some wonderful examples. And I think a lot of time opposition to these things comes because people don't know what to do, and so helping um, helping Ace helping us to help them you know, with these other uh, examples, I think is really uh, going to calm a lot of fears and help um, help keep people from raising objections just because they really don't know what to do with it. Thank you. Stephanie, I, did I interrupt you? 
No, oh, no, okay. I was just agreeing with Donna. <laughs> okay. And a quick note um, to everyone. So ACE is working in partnership with CSAB on some supplemental material, not just for programs and program chairs, but also program evaluators. So uh, people are just not caught off guard and also studies to understand where people are in the process and how they feel like they're meeting that. Um, Richard, I do want to give you a chance since you got cut off before. Are there any uh, strategies that you think we all as the general public can start to do to help support these efforts um, for approval of the criteria once they go to the voting body? Can Are there things we can do? Um, and even in the context of the anti-DEI legislation that you were talking about before, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, thank you very much. And sorry about that. I don't know, my computer decided to, <laughs> to go up. So um, in terms of what to what to do right now, we we you know we believe with grit, you know, with more engagement, we can basically refine most of these processes. And one of the things that um I believe either Donner or Andy mentioned earlier was to get involved, especially when the, some of these um you know updates, once they're out for public comment. And I really agree with the, you know, with the sentiments that we don't um you know, we don't have to wait until we have uh, maybe an opposing view before we make comments uh, to some of those updates. We can also provide positive reinforcement uh, once they go out for public comments, because I do believe that, you know, CAC uh, would, uh, you know, move forward with this, some of these updates in this coming July. So the general public should be aware of that. Once it's passed first reading, then it goes out to you know, to public comment. And uh, at that point, we we'll definitely need more engagement from everyone to provide comments and um, just provide ways in which we can make this better. And to to the other issue of uh, materials that will be needed, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Accreditation Council, particularly for the harmonized criterion, which is C8, uh, the Accreditation Council has uh, conveyed a, a committee right now that will, be, that will basically develop and work also to supplement some of the work that ACE is doing uh, to, to, to help program evaluators and also programs. And the IDEA Council is also supporting these efforts to create these resources that will be helpful uh, for programs to know what to do moving forward. Thank you, everyone. Um, as we're wrapping up, I want y'all to think about, um, is there anything that programs could do right now in preparation. So we see kind of the thought, general ideas of the criteria. What can we do in preparation to ensure that we meet the bar, but also are not necessarily doing a box checker type of solution? Yeah, we don't want box checker solutions. That uh, that will really short circuit the intent of this. Let me answer that in two ways. First, for if, if there are people online here who have really great case studies or examples of how DEI and A are implemented in the curriculum, share it with us. You, you, you can help shape the direction this goes by sharing really great examples that allow us to help educate others. But if what you're thinking of is, okay, but what can I do to prepare myself ultimately for the language? I'd say, be patient. Let this process work itself out um, so that we are sure that the language you're staring at now is the language that will be adopted. No, nothing is as frustrating as preparing for new criteria that ultimately aren't adopted. So, you know, I would say if you're if you're in a hurry, um, be patient, wait until, you know, the fall when we have sort of final decisions on these criteria, and then um, join us with, uh, you know, the efforts we're going to put forward on helping educate people on how to meet the criteria. That, that's going to be a big lift, one that CSAB and, and the commission itself will have to take on, and, and lots will we'll be eager to have lots of partners in that. But I wouldn't get started right now. And I well, agree I, with Cindy. Well, oh, I, I would agree with I would agree with uh, not getting started right now. Except I think there are things there are things that are just right to do with respect to DEI in the criteria in the in your programs. And I certainly wouldn't wait for somebody to tell me, well, oh no, we're only going to look at this part of this as part of our assessment. You know, some of the things that ACE has been working on and showcasing are are good for programs anyway. And, and it, even if they don't eventually become part of the, the criteria, um, the enrichment of your students and their success should be enough reason to do them. Yeah, you can't, it, it shouldn't be the case that DEI and A is only important to they that says so. That, yeah. that, that should not be true. 
Right. But in terms of meeting the specific wording and the criteria, wait, have, wait until yeah. that's been adopted. Right. Yeah. And we also welcome questions to the Idea Council, and um, the, you can basically send your questions to idea, idea at abet.org, and we're, we're very happy to engage wherever we can on these issues. Thank you, Stephanie. You want to close this out? <laughs> well, the, just uh, everyone agrees that this is not an easy process. It's not an a simple issue, it, but that doesn't mean you need to quit. That just means it's gonna be a little harder, but keep going. Thank it will you. happen. Thank you. All important words to remember. Um, I want to take this time to thank all of you for being so gracious to give up this hour to speak with us. Um, I've learned a lot as well, and I hope that everyone else did also. Um, I hope that we can also revisit this next year during our lecture series so that we can see where we are, the progress that's been made, and now what. Um, so thank you again to all of you, Stephanie, Richard, Andrew, and Donna. You have been extremely instrumental in helping shape uh, the next generation of computer scientists and what that impact will be moving forward. And thank you, everybody who attended today. Uh, again, we appreciate your time. This recording will be shared on the ACE website, identityncs.org. Uh, so you can feel free to share that with colleagues soon. And our next webinar will be for uh, postdocs. Anyone interested in a computing education postdoc or considering pursuing one, uh, which will be led by our ACE postdocs on April 16th. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great Tuesday, I think this is. And uh, take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.